yeah, I've given Sammy Hector overview talk. This is on behalf of, of Scott Croom as well for Sammy, and then uh, obviously me for Hector. So this first slide sort of sums it up in a nutshell. What we've got here on the left is an image of a very large amount of SAMI data, stellar mass, local density plane, showing an enormous variation in dynamics of galaxies that have been imaged with SAMI. This whole data set for SAMI all exists. Uh, there's a lot of papers been written and there's a lot gone into SAMI in this, this year. So I'll give you an update in a moment on what's happened with that. On the other hand on the right here, Hector is just starting. Hector is just taking galaxy data now. This is Hector on the AAT. And I'll now, first of all, launch into, oops, get it to, right. First of all, launch into the last 12 months of SAMI. So many papers have been published on a very wide variety of topics. I'm not going to go through all of these. Some of them you're actually going to hear about during this meeting, which is fantastic. But what you will see is that there's enormous variation in the physics that has been covered with the SAMI data. In total, there's been 96 team papers published to date. And you'll see from the histogram that we've been tracking very well, but this year in particular, we are, we're on par to reach the same sort of number of papers as we did in previous years. So there's been an awful lot coming out of the SAMI data. I'm gonna actually just highlight a couple of them. Now, this is cruel because there's so much good science. How do I pick a few? But the ones that have been picked here uh, the three papers I'm going to highlight, and these are really ones that have now used the SAMI data, not just in its own, but in connection to other surveys across so project work, which is really interesting. That's why I'm flagging it. Uh, so the first one here is a paper by Barbara Catanella, which is looking at the SAMI sample crossed with H1. So about 300 galaxies from SAMI in which she has H1 measurements, unresolved H1 measurements. And she looked at uh, the Tully fisher relation. You'll see the plots down the right hand on the corner here. And what she found was that the H alpha rotation velocities were systematically less than they are for H1. And so the optical Tully Fisher relation here then becomes steeper for H alpha than it is for H1. And this means that there's fundamental differences between the Tully Fisher relation and more importantly, fundamental differences in the physics of what we're actually seeing in the ionized gas within galaxies compared to the broader H1. And this was taken further um, by a paper by Adam Watts, which in which he showed, so the plots at the top right here, in which he showed that the, the global uh, a kinematic asymmetry in H1 and that in H alpha doesn't correlate at all, suggesting that they are uh, driven by completely different physical processes. So this highlights firstly the advantage of, of uh, comparison between the H1 and the H alpha between surveys such as SAMI and for that matter Hector in the future but that we really do need both in order to fully understand the gas kinematics in these galaxies. The next paper I wanted to flag was um, by Francesco. This was a paper that used SAMI data and MAGPI data and legacy data in order to be able to look at the evolution over time. So you'll see in the plot at the bottom here, SAMI data at low redshift on this redshift axis here, MAGPI data at middle, mid redshift and legacy data up, getting up to redshift of one. And what he did in this paper was measure the kurtosis of the line of sight velocity distribution using H4 and found that there is a strong evolution of that H4 index as you go towards a lower redshift. And this had not been seen before. And then he then discusses how uh, there's evidence that this is uh, from the impact of merging over the last seven gigan years, but in particular, the massive galaxies accrete mass and become more dispersion supported after becoming quiescent. So again, uh, the, the key benefits here are in, in cross-pollination of different surveys, uh, different wavelength bands, but in this case, different redshifts. All right, so those are a couple of highlights from Sammy. We've got a very short talk time here as we cover Sammy and Hector, so those are the only ones I'm going to go on to. But just to say that the Sammy is still rolling fast. There's, uh, these papers are listed on the screen at the moment are currently in preparation. They should be out this year. Again, a very broad range of science is being covered. All right, moving on to Hector, quick snapshot, the Hector Instrument and Galaxy Survey. Hector Instrument was built by Australis, used Sydney and Australis AAO. It has 21 IFUs, which are imaging fiber bundles or hexabundles that are varying in size and they are placed across the two degree field, at the AAT telescope. Pictures down the bottom corner here show a 61 core um, fiber bundle, which is the same size as in SAMI, but with regular cores. And we go up now to double that size, which is 169 cores, 26 arc seconds across a galaxy in Hector. 
And this is a picture of the focal plane, hectofocal plane on the AAT with all of the hexa bundles all configured for a galaxy field. The important aspect of hexa is the improved um, specs compared to what we had for SAMI. So the new spectra spectrograph, so spectra is the name of the spectrograph on hecta. The spectra spectrograph has higher spectral resolution. So in the blue, it's an R of about 3,800. In the red, it's an R greater than 5,000. It's substantially higher spectral resolution in the blue than we had for SAMI. The uh, Hector Galaxy Survey will do 15,000 galaxies, and this are targeted in the foremost waves regions, plus 11 clusters. And the idea of, of piggybacking on those regions is that the foremost waves regions will give us excellent environment metrics to be able to understand large scale and um, nearby and nearest neighbor uh, environment statistics. But equally, we've added 11 clusters because we want to be able to uh, trace galaxy evolution across all halo masses. And so we've gone to clusters that, that fill out the, the largest halo masses, larger than halos that currently exist within the, the waves region. So the Hector instrument had first light in December, 2021. There was commissioning throughout 2022, but in totally abysmal weather. And in some months we only had 20% actual clear time. However, we got there in the end and galaxy data um, started being taken in August. 2022. So far, we've observed 234 cluster fields and 108 field galaxies. But what's really important is that our rate of return is going to increase rapidly because in the last run, which was only last month, we observed 216 galaxies in that run alone. That's what happens when you have decent weather. And so we're very pleased about that. But also we have another run in a couple of weeks time, we've got another run in July, we've applied for another 50 nights in the second half of the year. So the survey will proceed with 90 to 100 nights per year. Uh, of observing planned for each uh, for each year for six years. Um, this particular video is actually showing the Hector uh, robot robotic positioner doing its thing, uh, locating magnets that are 100 newtons of force and placing them to within 20 microns accuracy. All right, so I really want to now just thank a bunch of people. So I'll highlight how useful Astro 3D has been to make the Hector happen. So on the one hand, we had the busy week last week for Hector. And what I really did note was there's 19 people in the busy week who have done substantial and are continuing to do substantial work in order to get the Hector survey happening. This involves things like target selection coordination, catalogs, observing software data reduction, and people have done observing. And so I particularly wanted to call out four of our Hector heroes, Sam Vaughan, Medusha, Stefania, and Shri, all of which I could not have done Hector without them. And they are fantastic and thanks to Astro 3D for the support of Hector, means that we have these fantastic postdocs um, who have contributed so much. All right, so in terms of where we're going with Hector, I said that the main aspect of Hector is its new capabilities, and that is the higher throughput, particularly in the blue arm of the spectrograph, the higher spectral resolution, already mentioned, the larger imaging bundles, larger hexa bundle size, we can see more of each galaxy, the larger survey size, 15,000 galaxies, and the fact that our survey strategy means that we're going to observe clusters out to two virial radii. Now, why does this matter? It matters because these were defined in order to achieve our overarching science goals, and those are the following. So firstly, how is the accretion of gas and angular momentum influenced by local and global environment? This is a fairly fundamental question, and it hasn't been been able to be tackled with another survey for a number of reasons. So what we're looking at here is that cosmic structures such as filaments and clusters constrain the flows and thermodynamics of baryons that are in their vicinity. And in order to be able to trace that and the impact of this large scale structure on the, the uh, structure of galaxies, and particularly their spin, you need a large number of galaxies, huge number of galaxies, and you have to understand the environment from large to small scales. So in particular, the highest throughput and the highest spectral resolution of HECTA will allow a much larger fraction of galaxies to have their stellar kinematics measured. The combination with the fact that there's a larger survey size means that your statistics are considerably higher. And then also we are observing out to the two Vera radii, which means that we have a much larger range of, of structures in terms of like being able to analyze how the filament wall, filament group, and filament cluster interactions impact the galactic inflows and the spin 
um, and the structures of galaxies. All right, the second key overarching science goal is how does galaxy mass influence the mass accretion and dynamical evolution of galaxies? So in this case, the highest throughput and the highest spectral resolution, again, give much larger fraction of galaxies which stellar kinematics um, can be measured. But more importantly, the stellar kinematics can now be measured down to a much lower stellar mass than could be done with SAMI. Equally, the larger bundles means that we can map the accretive material and transformations at higher radii for the high stellar mass galaxies who are going to fill those bundles. So therefore, we have dynamical transformations as a function of both mass and environment of a much broader scale than we have um, been possible to do before. The third key overarching science theme is how um, how do feeding and feedback influence galaxy evolution? So in this case, we need to be able to image the outflows and kinematic signatures and also be able to do mission line diagnostics of shocks and AGN and metallicities, et cetera. And that comes from both having the highest spectral resolution to resolve multi-component fits of emission lines, for example, as well as larger imaging bundles to be able to see further out off the plane of edge on galaxies, to be able to trace winds and outflows um, away from the galaxies and the dynamics of the gas that's associated with that. And the fourth one is how does the origin of gas influence star formation and affect the morphology of galaxies? So in order to answer this question, essentially you need both the dynamics of the gas and the stars. So in other words, the misalignment of the dynamics of gas and stars is a tracer of how gas is accreted into galaxies and now how that, that influences and is influenced by the morphology of the galaxies and the environment that they're in. With SAMI, one issue we had with this was that there's many galaxies which we could measure the kinematics of the gas or we could measure the kinematics of the stars, but we couldn't measure both. Now with a higher throughput and higher spectral resolution, we can be able to measure a much larger fraction of galaxies with both the gas and stellar kinematics. Also with the larger hexabundles, again, we gain in this science case because we can map the merger signatures and incoming accretion of gas much up, up to a much higher radius. All right, so that's all great. That's what we're gonna do, but how are we going so far? Let's have a look at what Hector is now delivering. Firstly, with the higher throughput, this plot here shows the blue arm and the red arm of the A omega spectrograph and the spectra spectrograph. You see the A omega as used for SAMI, um, the blue arm and the red arm in blue and red. The spectra spectrograph in the red is a little higher in throughput than, than A omega, but in the blue by design, it is substantially higher in throughput. And this was because we designed, we optimized the spectra spectrograph in every possible way to give high blue throughput because that was a limitation in SAMI that affected our science. And you will see from this plot that it has delivered. And so that highest throughput is, makes it substantially easier, particularly to get the stellar kinematics of, uh, of low mass galaxies. All right, next is the improved resolution of spectra. This plot on the right shows um, a segment of the spectrum of spectra in light blue and A omega in, in dark blue. And it's very clear, you can see the detail in the structure that you get from of emission lines and absorption lines you get from having that higher spectral resolution, which means you can fit the lines and their components much more accurately. It also means that in the blue with SAMI, we were getting down to galaxies that had a sigma its version of 70 kilometers per second, but that now becomes 30 kilometers per second with spectra or in the red that's 27 kilometers per second. This means we can spectrally resolve Milky Way like disks that we could not do before but also means we can measure the higher order kinematics, the H3, H4 kinematics, and up to three times the fraction of galaxies in the sample compared to what we could before. And that's mostly because of the distribution of this, of the sigma throughout the, the, the survey uh, galaxies. So it's something more than 75% of galaxies will have these measures possible, whereas you know, it was less than a third of that previously. As we already mentioned before, the, the measuring the stellar kinematics of dwarfs is, is important. It's actually a niche area for, for Hector. Because this plot down here shows the, the galaxy selection for Hector in a redshift and stellar mass space. We have these steps. And this bottom corner down here, under you know, 10 to the 9 or so stellar masses, is very difficult to measure stellar kinematics. This was a problem in SAMI. We get some emission lines on these, but they were, were a challenge for stellar kinematics. 
um, and you need to be able to about get, 20 seconds julia sure you need to be able to get this this uh very high spectral resolution in order to be able to see these galaxies and that is as i said a niche for hector so showing you how we're going now this is just a screenshot of raw data showing the h alpha and into lines in the red red arm but i've been telling to you how much harder it is in the blue so now i'm going to show you data this was just taken last month um, this is one galaxy this is what it looks like it's 10 to the 8th 8.8 .8, which means it's down in this region right a faint dwarf galaxy this is the imaging image cube you can see we're getting resolved o2 doublet in the center of the galaxy right out to the very edges of it and you can see the quality of the spectra very strong o3 lines in this particular one and the full h series um, and just to show that it's not the only one, here's two more. The, this one's a lovely interacting galaxy. Again, a low mass galaxy. These are the most challenging ones and we've got these resolved lines. We've got fantastic signal to noise in the spectra. This is a higher mass galaxy showing the same thing. This one's got high ionization O3 to H beta ratio. This one's got the opposite. So this is the quality of the spectra that Hector is now, now delivering. And we're very pleased with this and we're now going ahead with science i've run out of time so i won't go through this first science but these are things that these are three science cases that we currently now have hector data for and we'll go ahead with um hector team members writing papers on these straight away final summary much work still going on with sammy but we're now transitioning to hector hector is now taking science data there have been major contributions uh, by key astro 3d members and we're very pleased about that and expect science papers coming out for the end of the year Thanks very much.